You are watching CIO TV by Enterprise IT World, a production of Accent Info Media. Hello and welcome to the episode of uh, CIO TV dot live. We have been talking to various stakeholders to understand why India as a country is uh, becoming cyber attacks, par uh, cyber attackers paradise. And uh, every alternative day, you will see many of the large brands being hacked or being attacked. A statistic says that 85% uh, of organizations are hit by perpetrators, either through state-sponsored attacks or through APT groups last year. And this year, uh, we have got another quarter to go more than that. But the apprehension is that the number the percentage will be more because the geopolitical situation is completely changed now. So today I have a very decorative uh, cyber security professional. Uh, his name is Commander Sanjeev Singh, uh, CISO Bilasap. Before I start welcoming him, let me give you one liner with, uh, about him. He's an ex, ex Navy veteran from 1997 to 2019, uh, post that he served the private sector, including Deloitte, Virtuza, and now Bella uh, Commander Sanjeev, thank you very much for taking time out and uh, participating in this uh, episode of uh, Knowledge Series. Uh, welcome to you. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, thank you for that warm welcome uh, and the introduction. I, I look forward to this discussion. Okay, uh, before we start uh, discussing, uh, the first thing, is there any uh, affinity for the IT, ITA sector, uh, particularly for you? Because I see that uh, you, in your career graph, uh, it is Deloitte, uh, then Virtuza, now Bella Soft. But you are uh, into Indian Navy for a long time. Normally what happens, people uh, move out, uh, go to the manufacturing, or other sectors? Uh, not particular affinity. However, I would say I have been extremely passionate about cybersecurity right from the word go. Even as a youngster in uniform, I got into coding, etc. Uh, back in 2003, um, I was deputed by Navy uh, to do my MBA abroad, where I got a chance to enroll into a formal cybersecurity training program. That was my first formal exposure to cybersecurity. And since then, I got very, very interested. So while in Navy, my core role was as a marine engineer, I was trying to gas turbines, diesel engines, et cetera. But parallelly, I kept on um, exploring this area, working on this, and I got opportunities, got posted in areas where I could uh, do IT and cybersecurity kind of role. Uh, and so when I um, decided to um, shift uniforms and jump into corporate sector. Uh, I thought that was the best uh, way to get into or the best area to get into a cybersecurity. Uh, thanks to all my employers till date, they did give me an opportunity and uh, they saw my passion and give me the leeway to grow. And uh, so I'm thankful to them. And so this is me just following my passion. You are a close observer of this. Uh, landscape uh, in is while serving in uh, in forces now also otherwise in private sector you have been doing it uh, for at least uh, two decades is there any change in the pattern oh absolutely um, so if you go back two decades right uh, when we started our formal learnings of cyber security or even computer science we were told who are the attackers oh they are um, viruses trojans uh, nation state actors, uh, script kiddies, and maybe hacktivist to a certain extent, right? Uh, but then around 2012, 13 was the time where I um, see a radical shift in this entire business uh, because of uh, blockchain and Bitcoin, anonymous payments became available that allowed um, attackers to start monetizing whatever they were doing earlier. Uh, just prior to this, around the period of 2007-8, if you remember, uh, we used to have huge spam-related 
um, cyber security issues or incidents. Uh, and then moment these things got monetized, payments became anonymized. Uh, starting 2013-14, we saw the birth of a new breed, ransomwares. Uh, and since then, they have not looked back. It started small. Nowadays, they are like full-fledged businesses themselves, running like enterprises, earning a lot of money. Uh, and so that has changed a lot. And that was the beginning. I think today, everything is monetized in cybersecurity, whether it be data, uh, whether it be vulnerability, whether it be anything um, across the board. So everything has got monetized. And I think uh, this is something new. And this is also giving rise to new types of attacks, maybe, or new types of threats uh, for us as defenders to look into and counter. OK, now uh, we see a lot of uh... AI involved into it, automation involved in, into it, but a parallel or a learning from the Hamas uh, uh, Hamas Israel uh, episode is that uh, uh, I think no other army uh, like uh, you know Israel has got uh, uh, the AI or the automation into their systems. Still, then a lot of attack happened within seconds. So there is a question comes here, automation, machine learning, uh, even though we have to the greater extent, but human intelligence on the other side did that trick. So oh, absolutely. So human intelligence still rules, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing yet which can beat us. Um, artificial intelligence is still in its, I think, infancy, baby steps. At some point of time, they may exceed the human intelligence, but not now. Um, and there is one, I'd say, universal truth in security that you can never, ever be 100% safe. You can try uh, put in as many roadblocks as possible, put in layered defenses as possible, but someone or something will do get through at some point of time. Uh, what we can do is to look back at our layered defense and see where are the opportunities to catch them when they're trying to get through. Because even Hamas, for example, they fired so many thousands of rockets, few got through, many got destroyed by the Iron Dome, right? So the prevention may have failed at 100%, but detection was there. The new rockets are coming. They could blow uh, early warning sirens, etc. And same thing is applicable to cybersecurity. When somebody is trying to get in, maybe they fail once at one layer of defense, then they are successful, they try again. Uh, then they get stuck in the second layer of defense. Maybe they try a couple of times, they get successful, they bypass. But at each of those times when that attacker fails, do we have the right detection tooling to detect that? Uh, and hopefully, if you are able to then correlate and contextualize, and understand this is a cyber attack happening or getting prepared, we can hopefully stop them at that point of time. Uh, so we have, to, as defenders, we have to understand there is no 100% security. Uh, it's always a game of probabilities. So given the limited amount of budget and resources we have, we have to prioritize and see where we put in. Do we go into preventive mode? Do we get into detective? Do we... Do, take a mix of both, and then how do we build that layer defense in a manner where we prevent certain things, we detect certain things, and then we have a very, very solid mechanism to respond to when we detect. Because I had heard some this um, some, some time back, and I love it. It says uh, prevention is good, but detection is a must. However, detection without response is useless. Hmm. But what about complacency? Compliance? Complacency. Oh, complacency. Absolutely. Uh, that is something that we absolutely cannot afford. And the reason being attackers are evolving every day. Hmm. We already discussed they are like a business. They are always looking for newer um, or better ways to earn more money. That means... They are motivated, and so the fight is between their level of motivation and our level of motivation. 
So unless we are continuously evolving, continuously tracking their latest tactics, techniques, and procedures, and are building those detections or preventions in our defense, uh, we will lose. Because static defense no longer works. Our defense has to be agile, has to be flexible, and evolve at the same pace as the attackers, without which we would be defenseless in very, very quick time. So do you mean that uh, the defenders should act like or think like uh, the attackers or the hackers in our sense? Not necessarily, because again, everybody is equal, uh, not equal. Every organization is unique and different. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say they need to prioritize based on their risks and the threats. The threats mm -hmm. are again not the same for everyone. Threats are different for different different organizations, geographies, sectors, etc. And so that awareness from defenders as to what threat they are facing, what are the risks and impacts because of those threats. And so what should be the level of investment in which area so that they can then get the best return on investment uh, from their investments? Uh, you know that uh, IT industry or IT within an organization is not a straight boundary or a simple boundary. You have got many boundaries. You have got many perimeters. You have got many Absolutely. devices. So many machines, so many VMs, right? So many applications, so many APIs. What should be the strategy, ideal strategy? What should be the SOP? Oh, okay, so again, there can be no one SOP for everyone. However, uh, for organizations that are looking to start or are looking to mature, there are very good, uh, I would say, resources available freely for all of us. Okay. Uh, few things that I have loved and followed, there used to be something called CIS Top 20 Controls. Now, of course, they are CIS Top 18 Controls. They did a revision, I think, about a year back. Uh, and if you look back, and those set of controls have been there for last, I guess, 10, 15 years. If, if you look back, the few out of those 18s, there are hundreds of sub-controls maybe. But even there, they have nicely defined it in terms of hey, if you're starting at level 1 maturity, these are the things you should do. At level 2 maturity, these are the additional things you should do. And then at level 3, some more advanced things that they can do. And these are very, very foundational principles. Something as basic as need to have an asset management for hardware and software. You need to know what is your asset as compared to what is not your asset. So that tomorrow, if there is an alert or an event related to something, at least you're able to differentiate and then start prioritizing. And then other basic things like you should have a patching for um, not only operating systems, but also applications, etc. And so on and so forth, right? Identity security has become a big thing. So that there are a set of controls for that. Uh, I like them. In addition to them, there used to be something called um, ASC Top 35. Sorry, ASD Top 35. It used to be called Australian uh, Signals Directorate. Now, nowadays, I think they're called ACSC. Uh, and they have uh, top mitigation measures again. Mm -hmm. They, these are all freely available on the internet. Again, if you go and look at that document, they, they give certain recommendations to say, if you do this top four, top six, maybe, mm -hmm. you are already mitigating a large number of, uh, I would say, threats in that sense. Beyond these two, there are always, depending upon the technology stack one may be in, um, there are best practices by the OEMs, the vendors themselves. Few things nowadays almost everybody is pushing for is identity security, uh, especially post COVID as more and more organizations became digital uh, and adopted digital transformation. Where it's work from anywhere, work from any device, etc. Uh, and suddenly, I think identity became the new boundary. And even the bad actors, if you see many, many of the ransomware groups, they adopted this practice of one, stealing the identity through info stealers or otherwise, and then going and selling it out to other operators uh, who are good at um, deploying ransomware, that's it. So now you have uh, initial access brokers, IABs, who, whose 
core job is just to steal information like credentials. Mm. And then there are others like the ransomware affiliates or the operators whose job is to just use this information straight away, log into the target environment uh, and then start stealing or doing whatever they were supposed to do. Right. So they are evolving, they are operating, they are, evo they are understanding the changed, um, I would say the nature of business or the nature of uh, attack surface. Uh, and so must defenders. We have to understand that. Basic things like simple things like almost every organization now recommends have MFA. Uh, and just protecting username and uh, password is not sufficient today. Even there, we have seen last one and a half years, there was a lot of attacks around MFA bypasses. Especially last year, we saw attacks against some very large companies which involved MFA bypasses. So now going forward, you may realize that even just having MFA is not good enough. Um, having a good MFA uh, with strong detections around it is probably needed or start moving to a zero trust kind of uh, architecture wherein even with MFA, you still correlate that signal with other things like where is the user logging from which device is he or she logging from? Which geography are they logging from? And should they be allowed uh, access to the information that they're seeking? Those kind of things, I think this is where we are moving. Uh, and as this entire stack evolves, so must defenders evolve along with it. And for that, I'll relate it back to the previous question you asked, which is, should we think like attackers? That helps but we need not necessarily think like attackers. But if we know what they're thinking and is able to inform our decisions of how to build our defenses, I think that is a good thing. Now these certifications are uh, take, given to the, or taken by the individuals in an organization. Now individual, today's challenge for the individuals or the uh, you know human uh, resources, uh, is spiraling uh, globally in India also. HR, of course, we are saying that we have got skilled workforce, but then the real sense, if you are looking at somebody, uh, you are not finding many. And transition is happening very quickly. Somebody here moves out. In that case, how do you manage all these things? Like security oh, is very, uh, very, 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 very sensitive. You train somebody, he moves out. That's a loaded question. Uh, and I think that is a challenge that has been there, is there, and will be there. Mm -hmm. There is no two ways about it. But here is the balancing act. Now, if you do not train your people, then what we are going to suffer is the quality of work. And again, for us to be able to detect today's threats and to prevent today's threat, you need team members who are highly skilled, highly knowledgeable, and is aware about what is happening today. Now, is there a risk that if you invest too much into someone, will they move out? Absolutely, there will always be a risk. But at the same time, I, I have a feeling and something that has worked for me, not always, but most of the time is, as people mature, as they become technical, um, they, they like certain things. One of them, of course, is better financials, without doubt. But also, they like more challenges, more technically oriented work, more advanced work. And so, if we can consider that and start saying, all right, if I push you for higher learning certification, etc., I'm also going to get you more technically challenging work more satisfying work, rather than doing mundane routine work day in and day out, if anything can be converted into a process, then process can be standardized, made more efficient, and then possibly automated. Mm -hmm. And so the same person who was doing, say, one thing again and again and again every day, if you are able to now leverage their additional skills to help them identify streamline and automate the process so that they can move on to the next level of the stack. 
start thinking, okay, what more problem to solve? And I think problem solving is a skill if you are able to inculcate in our team members and start pushing them up the ladder into a higher skill. Will they leave? Some of them may, absolutely, but some of them will stick around. Uh, and as we start automating more and more and more, uh, I think we are in a better position. Of course, there are other things like cross-training, skilling, um, always be prepared for business continuity, etc. Uh, but I feel I am firmly on the side of training our people, upskilling them, cross-training them, etc. Because finally, that may be a risk, but there is a bigger risk of us getting attacked. Mm. And that has to be the primary focus. Mm. We can't remain at an average level in terms of the quality and efficiency of our entire security infrastructure, which includes tooling and people, just because of the risk of somebody will leave, uh, et cetera. Because we still have to prevent and fight against the bad actors. Mm. The other thing is that management side, uh, today's management members are uh, aware, but uh, I'm coming to hear, you know, some some uh, some people are saying that uh, if a CISO goes into the management, sits in the board, then uh, things will be better because cybersecurity is misunderstood, uh, though a very scary thing, and the aftermath can change everything. But it is mostly misunderstood by the board members. Do you think the board members are, the mood of the board members are really changing? So I I have limited visibility into this area because I, I get to experience only my board. Uh, okay. But they're very good. Uh, they understand security and they provide all the support that a CISO will need. Now they could be boards uh, which are probably not as mature, it, absolutely. So the problem is there, of course. Now, whether the solution is to put CISO in the board, I think it's for the company to decide because finally it's about recognition of the risk, cyber risk, uh, and as well as understanding that cyber security is no longer just a cost mm. or earlier considered as cost of doing business. Yes, that was true to some extent in the past, but today it is an absolutely enabling field. A company that does not demonstrate a good cybersecurity practice, hygiene, compliance, etc., they would find it is very, very difficult to do business. Mm -hmm. Because as our clients are getting mature, as they are becoming aware of the threats and the compliances, if you are not able to demonstrate that level of commitment, mm -hmm. I would find that's a state of a business risk. Okay. So I, my feeling is boards, they understand, they understand risk very, very well. Uh, it's probably a good communication strategy to make them aware of cybersecurity in the context of their own organizations. Whether at tactical level, board members should become more cybersecurity aware or get additional members who are cybersecurity experts. I think unless there is going to be a regulation around that, um, every company would decide uh, based on their own interests. Okay, uh, so since we are talking about human, uh, re not real uh, cyber things um, about the strategies, the other two things are related to uh, human also. One is that uh, human uh, is most vulnerable one. So a lot of uh, attack initiation uh, in, um, or indicators of attacks are the social engineering uh, attacks, social engineering lures that uh, people fall prey to. And uh, that by doing that, by clicking on a link or by answering a question or continuing the talk, they uh, become victim of fraudulent activity or in cyber sense is cyber attack completely. So how to mitigate that challenge? Any particular answer or particular area you see that uh, organizations need to improve or the CISOs need to improve to um, 
ask the employees uh, or better make the employees aware uh, that this is good link or that is this is not good link or I mean whatever. I would approach it at few levels. One mm -hmm. is like you rightly said, recognition that you not only humans, humans are one layer of attack surface. They are vulnerable just like other levels are vulnerable, like a poorly coded application or an application that is um, the importing a vulnerable software library, etc. So this is just one more layer, like any other layer, right? Unfortunately, I think um, the poor employees are mis mis misunderstood uh, many, many times. Yes, uh, should we invest in them to improve their level of awareness and knowledge? Absolutely. And I think most organizations do that from creating training and awareness for our employees to maybe um, doing fishing simulations and testing the level of preparedness. And absolutely, that is necessary. However, like any other attack surface, nowhere it is going to be at 100%. So someone sometime will click some link. Again, we are humans, we, are, we have emotions. 99.99% .99 of the time, I may realize it's a bad link or I should not be clicking. Someday I may be thinking something else, my mood is off, I'm angry at something else, and by mistake I click the link. So that will happen. We can never ever say 100% of my employees will not click a bad link 100% of the time. Hmm. I think as CISOs, we, we have to take that into consideration that someone somewhere will click a link. And then what is the risk? So that is the real question to be asked in my mind. Yes, somebody does click a link. Then what happens? Because at this point of time, attackers have not won yet. They have just maybe infected one machine. right? Or maybe they got credential of one user. Maybe username and password. Or like in nowadays, we're seeing a lot of MITM or AITM attacks like Evil Nginx, uh, where they may be able to steal a session token. So this is where I go back to identity security and say, OK, let me start with an assumed breach mindset and say, yes, somebody will click a link. And we will absolutely do everything in our power to train the user, make them aware, and try and avoid clicking the link, but somebody will click that link. What happens after that? Do I have sufficient identity security controls to say, even if the attacker has the username and password for a user, can I prevent the attacker from logging in? And this is where the first level of defense could be MFA itself. That yes, then the attacker also have to steal the second factor, which raises the cost to the attacker a little bit. Then they can do that MITM and AITM attacks and even steal maybe the session tokens, etc. Then still can we prevent the attackers? Do we have sufficient controls? Maybe things like zero trust, wherein we say for access to sensitive information in my environment, even if they are hosted on cloud, including public cloud, I need certain conditions to be met before somebody can log in. And it could be, for example, the device has to be corporate owned domain joined or the location has to be within the corporate network or whatever the case may be. If you're able to build those conditions into the my identity security infrastructure, then even if these things happen, there are good chances that the attacker may not be able to log in as that stolen credential. Uh, to prevent further damage. And in each of this, this is linked with a detection. If I'm able to detect those attempts of, say, Sanjeev normally logs in from his corporate laptop, and suddenly there is a login from, I don't know, China, Korea, wherever. And even if that login was failed because of the sufficient security controls, do I have that level of detection? And then see, okay, so there is this IP or domain or whatever, which is unusual. And if my security operations can look at that and determine whether it was valid or maybe something malicious. And if they determine it was not valid, maybe just go and block the damn thing uh, across the environment. So we, we can think of, so my feeling is we should look at humans more as an asset rather than um, 
as a liability mm -hmm. and i see a trend in many many um industry leaders who tend to think that if a user clicks on a link everything is lost no everything is not lost uh, we can still recover and build sufficient defenses and it's same every everywhere if if a application is running with a vulnerability we don't shut down the application we go and patch it up or we build additional controls around this to say all right let me run the application with a very very limited privilege so even if someone can compromise the application maybe they can't jump into the underlying server operating system and from there into the domain etc so we always build layer defenses and same things should apply even on this side of the equation with humans okay so so far we discussed about something which is invisible which is unknown there are cases there are intentional cases right um, intentionally data leak so in that case what so that is where the data loss or the data security infrastructure and controls would come into play mm -hmm. uh, so one thing i would like to share and this is something i strongly believe in uh, in industry we try and separate threats as external threats and internal threats now if you look at most of the attacks majority of the cyber attack that has happened in last 5 years you really cannot differentiate the attack may originate externally but once the attacker is inside the target environment maybe a server maybe a laptop desktop whatever or an application they are an insider nobody directly say attacks a sensitive database and steals right they will come in through something else maybe a phishing link in which case they will land on the user's laptop desktop uh, vdi whatever and from there they would laterally move to their target and from there they would steal that information mm -hmm. so once the attacker is inside the target environment they are insider so i look at every threat as an insider threat as that simple and then see do i have sufficient controls to detect that so why segregate the controls into insider threat and external threat some things we can stop at the perimeter absolutely those those are good those are external threats handled externally but majority of the threats are internal today attackers running powershell on users uh, devices that's an, as internal as you can get because it could be an employee running that powershell or an attacker running that powershell in either ways we have to stop it and same thing applies for even other areas where say somebody is trying to take out data whether it is an insider or an attacker who compromise that laptop and then is trying to take out data in both case our controls have to be exactly the same and this would be very well in terms of uh, the amount or the volume of data that is allowed to be transferred out the nature of data that is allowed to be transferred out you could classify the data and then for the sensitive data you can say it cannot go out of the environment now whether an insider does it or an outsider external actor does it both get blocked hmm. so i would say when designing the controls just treat everything as insider and design the controls based on that hmm. no i can make out how clear you are on the on these things and how positive you are on these things uh, so any particular technique or technology or tactics that you think that the cso's need to adopt because going forward things are uh, looking very dark very you know bleak i can say uh, in very straightforward way uh, it's not going to going to stop or slow down so i don't think i'm really in a position to advise you so they they know their environments best mm -hmm. and they know what is needed to be done however what i can share is few things that i always think of and that maybe would be helpful to few others one is to realize that there are two types of attacks in the sense there is an opportunistic attack which is something like hey i am using a particular technology a and this month that technology um, has revealed some vulnerability 
with a public exploit. Now, what attackers do? They just start scanning the entire internet for organizations that are using that particular technology and running the vulnerable version of that software. Uh, and so, if 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 we are not careful, uh, and if you're not very very, I would say, quick in patching those things, what you realize is that because attackers are not really targeting you, they're just looking for opportunities to attack. And opportunities present themselves in the form of these monthly vulnerability disclosures or ad hoc vulnerability disclosures. And if you're not quick in responding, somebody will probably run a scan, find out we are running a vulnerable software, and then try and exploit it and then get into the environment. In that case, we are a target of opportunity. What we can do is reduce that opportunity as much as possible. Uh, and so awareness is one of the biggest factors, I think, for CISOs. I spend a couple of hours every day just catching up on what's happening in the world, finding out, especially for the technology stack that we are in, to understand what's the latest feature got dropped, any vulnerability got disclosed, etc. Uh, and then try and be as proactive about it as possible to um, reduce that attack surface, especially for public-facing assets. The second, of course, is target targeted attack, wherein some threat actor decides to go after you. Now, those are very, very difficult uh, to get after because, again, it's a battle of motivation. How motivated are they to um, attack you and how motivated are we to defend ourselves, right? Which is where we can work to raise the cost of attack. Hmm. Like the benefit to the attacker is less than the cost of attack. They will probably give up and go away unless they are nation state actors or we are dealing with information that would be still very, very, um, I would say, welcome to them or they want that information at whatever cost because everything has got cost benefit. So if we can raise the cost of attack, even for targeted attack, there could be chances that at some point of time, attackers will give up and walk away. Mm -hmm. However, if we are, say, um, on the other side of a targeted attack, it will not be easy because typically those attackers would have done a lot of research on the organization that they're targeting. They would know how to break open things, etc. And that's where I think the detection controls have to be very, very strong security operations and the incident response teams have to be mature, alert, and able to identify those attacks, realize the impact and the potential, uh, and then quickly act upon it. Hmm. Also, as CISOs, the decisions we take on adopting and implementing technologies and technology stack, I think are important because, again, realizing those threats, risks, understanding at, again, what, because every technology we decide to spend on is a cost for us also. So if at what cost, what invest, return on investment are we seeking? What is the threat that we are trying to mitigate? Uh, all that is a big, big, big consideration. So on both sides, I think uh, we have to be aware of that. We can't just keep on going spending and spending and spending and bringing in more tools. I feel if you just keep on bringing more tools, we tend to leave open gaps, and those are the gaps that are exploited by attackers. So we have to be very, very careful because just investing more and more in technology may actually result in uh, lesser yield in terms of benefits. But rather be very, very wise in the choice of investments and technologies. Now, uh, post-attack, uh, emergency response team or, or these sort kind of environment. I was in conversation with some of the very senior people and asked about, do you have this? BFSI sector. They said that, no, we do not have. Government of India has. Do you think that it is mandatory? It should be, it is necessary that a sort kind of uh, uh, activities or teams should be there in house so that they can take care of if there is any adversary attacks happening. So again, I think it will depend upon organization to organization. Mm -hmm. Many organizations have in-house teams to do uh, security operations as well as incident response. 
many other organizations have uh, outsourced this to third party vendors, whether MSSPs, MDRs, etc. What I would suggest is when we think of SecOps or security mm -hmm. operations, we must also think of the incident response aspect because fine, you have detected an incident. What next? Uh, and that what next is exactly the question you asked about, Sanjay, which is how do we respond? Mm. The good thing is the earlier you start your response, the less the impact will be, as well as the cost of response will be low. Mm. So irrespective of whether we are doing it in-house or outsource, I think this aspect should be included wherein as part of the detection itself, because the initial investigation will happen by the SecOps team, again, in-house or outsource, doesn't matter. But mm. the moment you realize that this could be something big, if the incident response can start parallelly, maybe by the same team, right? We can start identifying and isolating things, blocking things, doing the containment phase, etc. So the earlier you do the containment phase, in any incident, uh, the more likely that we will succeed and lessen the damage. Uh, and so this aspect must be included. If we just think, all right, we will detect and then maybe go in and call an expert who will come after 24 hours or 48 hours, by which time the damage could be immense. So we must have in place some mechanism wherein the initial phases of the incident response should be able to start in as as quick time as possible. Okay, excellent. Now with the de uh, democratization of IT, do you think uh, the things or the toughness for the CISOs uh, in terms of taking decision uh, need to be there so that they can control every department? They say that okay, anything you are you are doing and uh, need to take approval from the CISOs. So again, I feel it's an organization to organization because mm. it's, it's about uh, behavior. No one size will fit all. Every mm. organization is different. Uh, and finally, both IT and security have to realize that we exist to enable the business. Mm. Uh, as far as that realization is there, and we can then work out what works best. Because again, from a risk perspective, you don't have to mitigate all the risks. There are risks that you will accept. There are risks that you will mitigate to some level to reduce the level, make it at acceptable level, etc. Mm -hmm. You can transfer some of the risks like cyber insurance. So there, everything is not, you have to do something about it. Again, you have to be very, very careful in how do we, one, identify the risk, and then two, what do we do about that risk? Mm -hmm. And... As CISOs, I don't think we can work independent of IT. IT and the information security have to work very, very closely. Uh, I'm not talking about. Uh, I'm not talking about the CISO or the silo should be different. Silo is one, but there are other department, marketing department, right? Or maybe legal. They do something. They download something, and which is happening in many many organizations in every organization. I would say. And that is not coming under the purview or the understanding of the CIO or CISO. Even the CIO knows or the IT department knows, they will do something. So, so CISO should have then multiple ways of knowing, right? So I either, mm. again, this organization to organization, uh, whatever works yeah. best. As CISO, the idea is you should be able to know. As CISO, if we only rely on, if somebody tells us, then we will know. Um, then maybe uh, we need to put in mechanic place some mechanism through which we know if somebody is downloading something malicious or something mm -hmm. that is um, not required to be downloaded or uploaded, whatever as the case may be, right? So one way to deal with it is, of course, have a process and procedure in place where people can inform security before they do it. But again, realize every control will be bypassed if they can be bypassed. Someone sometime will say, ah, okay, I'm in a hurry, let me do this. Right? So then what other mechanisms do we have 
uh, in terms of say detection, data security, data loss, whatever the case may be, or EDR, XDR, etc., from endpoint or from network perspective, where we can have visibility into what is happening across the organization. And there, if we catch any policy violation or something which is not supposed to be happening, then we can raise it. And absolutely okay. nothing stops. So, and if you see, this is a big, big practice happening uh, across the environment, and it's a big risk. You can always raise it as a risk, reach out to the mm -hmm. senior leaders, work with them. And if it is a big risk, then maybe a, a proactive measure to reduce it. If it is a small one, mm -hmm. then we can think of putting in some controls to either stop it or reduce it, whatever. So I would say, again, no one size fits mm -hmm. all. It has to be based on what we are seeing, what is the risk level, what is the threat level, uh, and what can we do to allow them to do it? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, hopefully deter them from doing things they are not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So security should not work or security should not be so brittle, I would say, that the user experience is impacted not massively. Today with on on one side from business side, we're saying digital transformation, work from anywhere, uh, work from any device, etc. Security has to adopt to that and say, okay, fine, we do allow you, we allow better user experience. At the same time, we keep you secure in those areas. Mm. Okay. On the on the uh, organization side, when I raise this point of uh, departments doing their stuff, uh, um, downloading any software or creating, you know, developing a software, uh, do you believe that uh, depths of depth sec up should be a culture within the organization so that uh, there is less burden on the uh, security department, cyber security department? Oh, absolutely. DevSecOps is good. I would highly recommend it. Um, again, the reason being that is one of the first things that started this shift left security, which is to mm. start taking in security at the time of development itself. Before that, and even now, many, many organizations find just doing static SAS and DAS type of testing once in a while, once in a year, kind of. Uh, and then thinking we are safe for another year. But that's not the case because vulnerabilities are coming in and every day, not only in the code that may got may get created within the organization, but also nowadays modern coding requires a lot of libraries to be imported. Some of those libraries may have vulnerabilities. Like Log4j, we saw the biggest example. Hmm. And uh, so how do we counter that? How do we take into account those aspects? Because that increases our attack surface, not only to the code we own, but also to the code that we are using in that code that we own. And I think that is where Sec DevOps rules, because it brings in an agile and a flexible framework to bake in security, not only at the time of coding, but also during the operations phase itself. So the entire life cycle of the code is kept secure. But again, it has to be implemented well, it has to be thought out. It's more of a process than a tool and technology. So the entire uh, architecture, the design has to be considered very, very carefully. All right, Commander Sanjeev, thank you very much for taking so much of time. We um, you know, thought of uh, doing this session for 30 minutes, but I can see the watch it continue till uh, one hour. Um, I couldn't, uh, you know, feel there is any place you paused or um, you deviated from this. So thank you once again uh, for taking time out and uh, absolute pleasure on my part uh, to host you uh, and uh, uh, listen to your uh, thought process around the entire subject. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you for inviting me and giving the opportunity to share my thoughts. Um, hopefully, somebody will benefit from this. Thank you. Again. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. That is, is the whole purpose of uh, giving our experience uh, to the uh, to the peer group or uh, or boarding uh, CISOs or uh, security professionals. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, it will be a piece of advice uh, that they should enjoy uh, listening to. Thank you. Thank you.